Today we're looking at Ochna and Ochna is like many of the weeds that we have growing in this area a plant from South Africa it's so it's well adapted to our climatic conditions for a start and so it can tolerate quite long periods of drought and uh, it has very similar requirements to many of the native plants that grow around here um, it normally grows from a seed and the seed is spread by birds because it has a fleshy seed they are prolific seeders and they don't have very many predators in our country the predators in their own country I believe uh, one of them is the rhinoceros and that's partly the plant has adapted to being browsed by herbivores in that it has a very long taproot and then as the taproot comes to the surface of the soil it has a kink in the root so that when the herbivore drags the plant it breaks off at that point and there's a good example there uh, when the herbivore drags at the top part of the plant it breaks off just below the surface but the plant itself has many uh, new buds which can then reshoot so it is a problem as a bush regenerator it's a problem that when you pull it up they think we're a rhinoceros and uh, they just snap off at that point and they regrow and here's a an example here where some somebody has previously treated this plant they've cut the um, stem they've poisoned the stem they've scraped down only to the surface of the soil and part of the plant has died back but then the, the buds below the soil have shot up and you end up with a, a whole tuft of new growth and these are quite difficult to, to deal with because you've got multiple stems which you would have to scrape and paint each one of those stems for the small ones they're very hard to, to scrape and paint with herbicide so it's worth trying to pull them out the, the slightly larger ones we're going to do scraping and painting and the scraping and painting we've done before in this site but we didn't do it very well in many cases some of them died and some of them didn't so I'm going to try and show everybody just to demonstrate the, the method which we found to be the most successful with scraping and painting we cut them and put herbicide on the top they reshoot from the base and they're more difficult to treat when they've re reshot from the base and uh, we've done cut and split with a pair of secateurs put herbicide in that probably worked in 40 50 percent of the cases now the other method which we're now getting contractors to do and we're using a herbicide called star rain and star rain you mix it with diesel at two percent and then you paint that onto the stem so you start right at the base and you cover the stem with the diesel star rain mix and you cover about half a meter of the stem and that's very effective at killing them it takes maybe a month or two just to, to, to see that they're completely dead. Is that scraping dead. first? Or Not no. scraping, no, you simply paint, paint it on the, on the surface. But we don't, uh, we don't ask volunteers to do that. Some of us have done, quite a few of us have done the chemical certificate training. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the herbicide to move down the root system and kill the roots. <laughs> and to do that we want to get as much leafy matter still operating because what that's doing it's, a, it's effectively a pump so it's moving water up from the deep in the soil because it's got a very deep um, taproot tap root. and these are producing the sugars which are then being transferred back down to the root system so you're wanting this whole system to be pumping as much through it so that it'll take, take the herbicide to where you want it I'll see if I can get this one out just to see how long the, the root system is <laughs> so see how it's got like a little right angle kink and what yeah. that that's that creates a stress point so when you pull it it'll often break there or there and uh, once it breaks there there's enough reserves in the root here to reshoot so little ones this size that size I suggest we can pull up in this area it might be able to see a difference in color there this from here down it's kind of browny slightly pinky perhaps 
and this this up above has got a bit of a green tinge to it. So what we're trying to do is get uh, a scrape about this length up the plant. Bloody <laughs> hell, we haven't been doing that. No, that's right. So Margaret, Margaret was just asking if this is a multi-stem plant, do we need to do each stem? And yes, we do, because the you can kill one or two of these branches, the others will keep feeding down into the root system and it will reshoot. So we're just getting a good, quite hard cut. And we want to get the herbicide just covering that cut and we want to get it on within 20 seconds if we can that's amazing 20 <laughs> okay so there we go now the other method which um, I think it's Karen Nippard is it yeah. Pitwater Council does is up at about this height she does what they call a stick fracture so you're just trying to get a break in the the tissue and get that it get some herbicide into there as well and the point is you're and leaving the plant intact and you leave the plant so you push it back up again you could if you want do another one on the other side but what you don't want to do is you don't want to ring bark the plant so you don't want to get you don't want to scrape it all the way around because you're depending on the plant pumping the herbicide up and down and this one's a, a useful plant, a useful individual plant to look at because it's on the top of a, a dune and the sand has been blown over the dune and burying the stem. So it, it'd be quite hard to probably, so this is an old bitu bush that's been killed in a previous sweep through here. So it'd be quite hard if you look at this, it's coming out of the sand and that stem really swollen. is really swollen and I'm just seeing whether that was where it originally oh yes that's probably the yeah. original you can see the new shoots and they're all buds they're dormant they're like buds. stem cells yeah that's there. right yeah they're, they're all ready to go when the rhinoceros comes and eats the top off or one of us butcher generators so if we, we were to treat this plant here yes. above this point we probably wouldn't kill it. Exactly. We have to get below here. Into that into that. So we tissue. have to dig into that gene and get either into that tissue or below it exactly. and treat this plant. Exactly. Otherwise it's going to survive. It is going to survive. So I will... We can do this two methods. We could paint it with the star rain or we can do what I'm doing here which is scraping the sand away. It's quite, it'd be quite a, a thick plant to... Um, to get some herbicide into it but what I'll do I'll give this a you can see that pinky pinky um, bark there now I'll get some herbicide onto that and then I'll do another couple of scrapes so that so you want to cover all of that recently scraped area but I do need to get a lot more of the bark scraped than that so we now need to quite an awkward plant this one so this is where probably doing the star rain treatment would be better because it's strange stems Strange arrangement of the stems, and uh, try not to um, get this to run and dribble on the ground because we don't want to get any extra herbicide around the plant because it might be a native seedling quite close by. But uh, and now I'll do a few more scrapes on this plant. So each, doing each individual plant in this method is quite quite slow. There we go. Now we need to take off all these seeds and we'll bag them and take them away. So this plant has multiple adaptations. It has a very deep root system. It's spread by birds. It 
it grows in dense shade, so we find it in, in amongst the rainforest. Uh, it can grow in sand dunes, it can grow on clay, and has prolific seeding capacity. So once you get it into the system, it's quite a, a time-consuming plant to remove. Well, um, what would you say to people who feel they must have this plant in their garden? Well, I think they should really come out and see what, what effect that has in nature. If you come out, this, this particular plant, uh, these, these plants are quite close to the township and I know of several large bushes in the town which people have had there, um, you know, as an ornamental and the seeds are spread for several kilometres now around the area and so I would think this is consuming tens of thousands of dollars in um, funding for getting contractors to work on and hundreds of hours of volunteer work to come and do follow-up work on it. So yes it might be a very pretty plant to have in your garden but the consequences of having your pretty plant is that we end up having to spend a lot of time getting it out of the natural environment. So it's costing vast amounts of money. Vast amounts of money when you think you know we're just one small patch of of um, the New South Wales coastline um, dealing with this plant and I suspect it's in most around most towns and villages along the coast uh, it's creating a huge amount of damage. And it's got a, a huge environmental cost as well. Exactly. Which is where the money's being spent. Yeah, of yeah. So it's, 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 it's upsetting the, the balance quite a bit in that it's providing it probably has seeds at other times when the native plants aren't seeding so the birds are preferring it so populations of birds the, the, the dynamic of the bird populations changing because this food source is here they carry it into the bush they reduce the diversity of the bush because this plant is a very competitive plant and able to proliferate in the understory shade out uh, native plants so you end up getting a simplifying of the system and uh, like most simple systems they're more vulnerable to you know fire any kind of disturbance if you get fire climate change all these things are going to have an impact on the forest a diverse forest is going to be more resilient than a simple monoculture or a reduced diversity so it has subtle long-term but quite devastating consequences that and people often don't realize and birds eat them and even though they may just fly 100 metres, 200 metres before they poo out the, the seed, every year this plant just moves further and further into the bush and uh, it has the capacity to really dominate the understory, particularly in these um, uh, rainforest areas and littoral rainforest is an endangered ecological community and this is one of the things that is endangering it this and several other weeds. So we've got bitu bush, we've got asparagus weed, so we, we're, we're dealing with all of these weeds in sequence. First of all we got rid of bitu bush through here because that was the dominant. Now we're having to deal, we, we've also dealt with asparagus through here, now we're finding we've got the ochna. But it, it, it's over time the native plants of really, th really thriving now, so we're getting a really good regeneration of native plants, and, but we do need to spend the time, spend the years, spend the energy, spend the money to get in there and do the follow-up so that the system becomes resilient. Once the system's, you know, all the niches are pretty well filled by native plants, much more difficult for these to get in. So if we can remove them from the seeding plants from the local environment, then if we do get a fire through here or we do get some major disturbance then the seed bank's not here to, to take over. So our job is to get the bushland ready for the next time there's a, a disturbance so that when, when uh, the plants are regenerating what you get are the native plants not the weeds.